Well, I uh, want to continue on. We've been in 2 Samuel for quite a long time, and uh, so <clears throat> has been my, uh, my practice to just keep going through it bit by bit by bit, and now we're getting right down to the end. We've said that we've gotten down to the, uh, uh, the appendices of the book. These, the last four chapters are, uh, uh, or last three, uh, are uh, kind of uh, an addition to the book. And so some of them are picking up different areas in David's life, events that have happened in his life and kind of reiterating it. And today I have entitled this message, He is My Rock. And this is a song that David wrote. It said that he wrote this when he was uh, escaping his enemies. He, he says, uh, And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, and then we go on from verse 2 to the end, which is 50 verses. And what this is, is a reiteration, or perhaps it's the first rendering of uh, the uh, Psalm 18. Uh, in Psalm 18 that I quoted from this morning, we read from the 30th to the 37th verses, and uh, Psalm 18 is just a little bit more refined. He's kind of tuned it up for the, for the music of the temple, I suppose, but it's in, it is pretty much intact. It remains the same. And so I find these to be beautiful. These are beautiful. One of the the indications of the creativity of God is that he has placed in us, us being created in his image, he has placed in us a measure of creativity, and in some more than others. And so I marvel at those who can put together words in poetry and bring out thoughts in such a beautiful and elegant way. Um, <clears throat> when I think of this, I think of some of the old hymns, and I was really pleased that the last song that we sang, Come Thou Found, that how beautiful the words are uh, put together, beautifully the words are put together, and how they rhyme. You notice that every other line rhymes with the next stanza, and at goes throughout the whole thing, and yet it has a unified thought to it, and it's a beautiful and profound thought. And I'm not sure, I've never done a deep dive on this, but I suspected that it's, that it's uh, English that does this. I've heard songs sung, you know, you hear uh, songs sung in, in Spanish or other languages, and I, of course, don't speak those languages, but I don't hear a rhyme as I go through the song. A lot of those songs, they go on and on. They tell a story, and they're, they're creative, of course. But I'm, I'm wondering if it is uh, unique to English that we have ways of rhyming the words and bringing out the thought in that particular way. And I think that is a marvelous thing. It's, a, it's truly a miraculous thing when you think about it. Because speech in and of itself is a miracle. Think of how that works, that we generate an idea in our brain and it is immediately taken right to our mouth and our, our voice box is activated by the air that flows through it and we can form the shape of the words in our mouth and it goes out as sound waves through the air and your ears, which are tremendously sensitive, amazingly sensitive, your ears pick that all up and convert that sound wave into an electrical impulse which is then carried to the brain which then ciphers it out and turns it into a thought. And we understand each other for the most part. You think what a marvelous and miraculous thing that is. And it's wonderful that in his creation of us, that he's put within us the ability to draw out that emotion and to put it to pen and paper, and to write it out that it could be maintained for years to come. In this case, 3,000 years. And David sat down in his joy and relief, 
and he took stock of things around him. And I think this is a good practice for us to do from time to time. Just to sit down after the heat of the battle, when things are kind of settled down, take a little time to just sit and reflect and to realize how God has brought you through. And by doing this, we reinforce that confidence that we have that God will take care of us. I've uh, always been pleased that I was brought into God's household at a very young age. I uh, just grew up in the church. It was a pleasant experience to me all the years of my life. I enjoyed it as a child. I enjoyed it as a teenager. I enjoyed it as an adult. And I can remember, I can remember teachers that I had in my Sunday school classes. My parents came to the Lord through uh, the ministry of the pastor of the Christian church right over here. But there was some kind of an upset, and they had a split, and their group went, part of the people went somewhere else. This is one of the sad tales of Christianity and, and the church. It's so much better when brethren dwell together in unity. So much better. But nevertheless, sometimes things happen. And when it does, God's still going to have a way through it. And I thank God that my parents, even though they were with the wandering ones, they were brought into the fold. And I can remember going to Sunday school right over here in the, what is, is this? The, it's not the VFW hall. It's, the, it's another military hall. Just right over here in the next corner there. And uh, I can remember, I can remember a couple of the sermons and I was only two years old. And I, I remember one that was pretty, it was pretty out there from what I can remember. And... Uh, uh, and then eventually the healing came and everybody went back over here and got back together again and I grew up in that church over there. And many wonderful Christian people who had a part in my life. And I can remember in those early years, there were times I grew up on a farm out here west of town and uh, as a oh, junior high age, I suppose, uh, I finally got my own room because we grew up in this tar paper shack and five kids in an 800 square foot house with only one bedroom and mom and dad slept on a, a fold out bed in the living room and the rest of us kids were at the other end of the house and um, so consequently we grew up with this great desire to have a spot of our own and so I made a spot of my own in the upstairs of the two-story building we had this old chicken house building and we had an upstairs building and and I was able to make a bedroom in there and had a stove and, and all. And so I had my own space, which gave me an opportunity to wander if I wanted to. And I remember it was fun, on a, especially on a summer night and a full moon, to just go for a walk. And I'd go out and I'd walk down a couple of miles down, hike back to the house and everything else. And it was a time to commune with God, to sing and to uh, think about him. And it was at that point in my life that I became aware and became convinced that God would take care of me. And throughout all the years of my life, now 77 years old, and I look back and I say, you know what? He did exactly that. In ways that are amazing to me, that I had no concept and had no foreknowledge that he could possibly bring it about. And yet he has done that. And so it's good for us to take the time to sit down and to reflect and to marvel at how he helps us. And when, he do, when we do that, it empowers us for the next battle. Because when you have the confidence that he has brought you through the storm, to this point, you can have the confidence that he will bring you through the next storm, which he will. And so this is a wonderful, wonderful psalm for us to consider. 
I broke it down into seven parts. That's not a real good, you know, you know, sermon type of a thing. You know, you shouldn't have more than three. And I suppose I could have jammed three or four of these to, together in one place and made something up, but it kind of falls into seven parts. And it's a description of God in his attributes. The first part is God is a refuge. God is a refuge. He says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge. My Savior, thou savest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The Lord is a rock, a solid spot. Don't know if you've ever been in a in a unsteady place. When you are, it feels so good to get into a steady place. And so no matter what the situation, we can depend on him to be our rock. He is our fortress. When all the things about us in life are assailing us, he is the one to whom we can retreat. And we can pull shut the doors and batter them down and, and be safe from attack. That's why Sundays are so precious, really. It should be a time of contentedness time of goodness, a time of closeness, a time of worship, a time of remembering. And it fortifies us for the week to come. And so we declare this, he's my rock, he's my rock, and we have to be willing to declare these things. He is my rock, in him will I trust. And we have to tell ourselves that when the storm is blowing around us and we're getting beaten up, we have to keep repeating that over and over. In him will I trust. In him will I trust. In him will I trust. A shield. A horn of salvation. Most of the animals of the kingdom who have horns use them for defense. And they are quite effective as such. You know, just ask somebody who's been picked off by a bull and cast into the air. I've got YouTube, I can see that. These guys who run in the streets of Pamplona, Spain, you know, and let the bulls run there. And one, one, every now and then a bull catches one of those and he goes like this. And the guy goes flying up in the air like nothing, you know. He comes down with a lot of injury. The Lord is my horn of salvation. He's the defense against the greatest enemy that we have. And he brings salvation. He's my high tower. Don't you feel good when they're sneaking around and you can be in a real high spot and you can see them down there <laughs> and they can't get you? That's who he is to us. The atheist cries out, God is just a crutch. And the man of faith says, no, he's more than that. He's a wheelchair. My Savior, thou savest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to pray, be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. I love that song. It's one of my favorites taken from Scripture, from Psalm 18. It says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. And then you jump down to about the 40th verse. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. That should be the cry of our heart. Secondly, he reacts. God reacts. It says, when the waves of death compassed me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord, and I cried to my God, and he did hear my voice 
out of the temple. And my cry did enter into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook. And because he was wroth, there went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth. Devoured coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down. And darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and, and did fly. And he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Though the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled, the Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. And the channels of the sea appeared and foundations of the world were discovered at the rebuking of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils." He reacts. When I read in the seventh verse that he did hear my voice out of his temple and my cry did enter into his ears, I am comforted knowing that no matter what the circumstances, no matter where I find myself, no matter how bad it is, or no matter how low I have sunk, that God hears my cry. In Psalm 22, uh, we have a tremendous description of Jesus in his agony upon the cross of Calvary, written long before the Romans even devised crucifixion. And he goes through all of this, and he is in the worst of the situation, and Many have thought that at this point that he is just completely separated from God and that God has turned away from him. And I haven't been able to read it that way because I read in the 24th verse of Psalm 22, it says, For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. No, he didn't do it. It seemed like it. And how many times have we gotten into places where we seem there is, there is no God He's not looking at me. He's not paying attention to my problem. We get that way. That's the depth of our emotion. But the reality is, he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. We all know the result of that because there was tremendous victory where we look at it and say it was terrible loss and it was an injustice and it was political persecution and it was a horrible thing of man's inhumanity to man. But no, it wasn't. It was a plan. It was devised from the foundations of the world, the lamb slain from the foundation of of the world. It was all going according to plan. And when we looked at it as hopeless and everyone who followed him had turned away and withdrawn and was steeped in their, their sorrow and disappointment, that's when the impossible happened. Three days later, they go down there in the morning. They're going to dress the body because they had to be so hastily put him in the in the sepulcher of the rich man Joseph of Arimathea and lo and behold they find that the stone is rolled away there's an angel sitting on it all the soldiers are dead to the world they've all fainted in fear think of what it takes to make a Roman soldier of the Roman legion to faint and they're all passed out and there it is the empty tomb and we know the rest of the story as it unfolded. And too often we try to uh, focus our life on this very, very dark portion of what's happening to us, not realizing that around the corner there is victory. And when we experience that going around the corner, that's the time for us to sit down and to reflect and to praise God for what he has done. It's a time to spend some time in Psalms. 
And it's good to spend time in Psalms too because a lot of the emotion that we feel and we don't have the talent to put it down in print. Praise God, the Holy Spirit through the David the King who had a heart for God and had a talent for singing and he just wrote it down and he expresses our feelings. God reacts. This description of his reaction, you know, you got to remember that coming through the Red Sea and escaping from the Egyptians and all that hadn't been that long ago. And back in those days, you know, you didn't have TVs to, uh, to activate the beta waves of our mind. And so instead, they'd sit around the campfire and they would recite history and would recite the things that they, what their great-grandfather told their, great, their grandfather, which told their father, which told them. And now I'm telling you and I'm telling your kids. This is what happened. And think of the description. If you had been there, to think if you were one of the people who walked through on dry ground, for crying out loud, with this wall of water on both sides of you, because and it goes up, you can't see the top of it, and you go through it on dry land with a million other people, hmm, that's something you'd probably remember for a couple days of your life anyway. And then you're out there, you're wandering around in the wilderness, and, and your leader says, okay, you people wait here, I'm going up on the mountain, I'm going to talk to God. And you know he's talked to God before. He's, he's done some pretty remarkable things. And so he goes up there. He's going to talk to God. And then you see all that's going on up there. The fire and the deep cloud across the top of Mount Sinai. And uh, all of that going on. He said, and the experiences they had. And then he, and thinking about just wandering through the wilderness for that time and Every day you go out there and it's a nice sunny skies today, except for that one column of cloud that's out there in front of us. Now we'll keep following that cloud. And at nighttime it's light. You know, it's all lit up and it's lightning in it and one thing or another. A lot of description there. And so these people have some kind of, something in mind when he makes this description of God's reaction. He rescues. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, for the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also upright before him and have kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore, the Lord hath re recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyesight. He rescues he rescues. He drew me out of many waters. Years ago, back when I was young and beautiful and strong and active, uh, we were on a day trip out to Coronado Island, out of San Diego. And uh, we went out there uh, to play in the surf. It was a beautiful day. The water was probably about 70, 75 degrees, you know, just delightful swimming conditions. And uh, I don't know where we were. I can't even remember all the people that were with me on that trip because we did that trip before. But at any rate, I was out there kind of body surfing in the water. And I uh, got in the wrong place to where the wave broke over the top of me. And when the wave broke over the top of me, it took me down to the sand, and it went like that. And I was beat. And then I finally got up, and I came up, and I took a breath. And the next wave caught me, and it took me down and just jammed me on the bottom of the ground and rolled me over, and, thud, thud, thud. and I struggled, and I fought, and I managed to get up, 
and I took one breath, and a wave came down on me, and it jammed me down, and it rolled me over. It did that five times, and I'll tell you, the fifth time, I was done. I had no more strength at all. And thank God, the fifth wave spit me out. And I just laid there for the longest time. I just laid with the gentle water coming up around me, you know. (sighs) Catch my breath. But my goodness, the power of that water around me. I have seen... Uh, videos taken in the canyons of Utah. And people are hiking up these canyons and they're very narrow and all of a sudden they realize there's a problem and here comes some water. And they start running out of the canyon trying to stay ahead of the water and the water catches up to them and it goes past and they keep running and running and they're filming the whole time and the water keeps getting deeper, and now it's up around their knees, and they're trying to run as fast as they possibly can. And they finally get around, and they get to a spot where they can get up high enough, and the water fills the whole canyon and goes washing by. And the locals say that every year somebody drowns in the canyon because they don't pay attention to the weather. And it's not just the weather where you're at. You need to pay attention to what's the weather up higher, Because if they have a rainstorm up there, there's going to be flash floods in the canyons. And they can be gigantic. We were down in Texas and uh, there in in, uh, Fredericksburg. The uh, Perdinalis River goes through there. And they call it the Perdinalis and it's spelled P-E-N-D-E-R-N-A-L-A-E-S, I think. And they call it the Perdinalis. Well, the Pernanalis is there, and you go out to this mighty river, and you go to it, and you get to the main part of it, and it's about this wide. And you think, well, that's not so impressive. And so one day we were in Austin, Texas, and we had some time off, and our friends happened to live in Austin also. Our kids were living in Austin at the time. And so we took a few days off, and we went with uh, Mike and Cindy, and we uh, went to the big park that's there. It's some waterfalls, it's called. He said, well, this isn't impressive. All it is is just a boulder field. And we finally worked our way out to the middle of the Perdinalis River, and I could step across it. But they had pictures there, permanently etched pictures. It said, when it's raining, pay attention, because this is what the Perdinalis looks like at this point. And instead of being a foot and a half wide, it's now 400 yards wide, and it's a roaring, tumbling torrent. Unbelievable. And that's the way life can be for us sometimes. Where we get caught in the middle of it and it's an irresistible force and it's hard. We, it's more than we can deal with. And it's at that point, the person who is rescued from that kind of a situation, they look back and say, it is God who plucked me out of the waters. And when we are in the deep waters of the bad times of our life, it is God who plucks us out of the waters. Now, as he goes down here, he talks about how the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, hath he recompensed me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and and not wickedly departed from my God, and blah, blah, blah. And he says all of that, and... It's not true. You know, it is right that we operate our lives in a righteous manner. It is altogether fitting that we do our best to do that which is right. It is the proper thing for us to be honest. It's proper for us to be forthright and to be uh, sincere in what we do. It's proper for us to be helpful and to desire to help other people. But that is not what makes us right with God. He rewards that. He rewards that. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of experiences in life and we, we uh, get the... Uh, the old saying is virtue is its own reward. 
And it is. You know, you feel good. You do something nice, and you feel good. And, uh, and I tried to teach my uh, kids that if you can do something nice and not be caught doing it, that feels even better. And that's what we should do. But we should never look upon that to say, oh, Lord, that my righteousness buys me something with you. It does not. Because God has done everything that can be done in order to make us right with him. It's all him who has done it. And when we look back at it, we find that even the faith that we have in God is a gift from him. See, so that no man should boast. See, this is kind of a problem. There's, uh, there's the, a movement going throughout Christendom. There's always one wave or another washing through Christendom. And one of the things that's coming up uh, a lot now is Reformed theology. And these are brothers of ours and all. But there is a feeling that, you know what, this grace is all, all right, but you need to do something more. Your life has to really show it. It does. Yeah, well, it should. But what do you do for the one who's young and weak? Do we make them feel rotten? Surely they know they're rotten because that's why we came to the Lord. That's why we all came to the Lord, because we're rotten. And he's the one who makes it right. He is the one who does it. And we should keep our eye on that. He rescues us. He's a refuge. He reacts. He rescues. He responds. He responds. He says, with the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With the upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. With the froward, the unrighteous man, thou wilt show thyself unsavory. And the afflicted people thou wilt save. But thine eyes are upon the haughty that, they, that thou mayest bring them down. For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. For by thee have I run through a troop. By my God have I leaped over a wall. God responds to us in the way we are, that is how he responds to us. James, in the fourth chapter, in the eighth verse, gives us the admonition to draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So our Christian walk is a continual walk of improvement, should be. We should be working on it every day. About the time you think, oh, I have arrived, some new thing will raise its ugly head in your life. And you'll realize, you know what? I'm not going to arrive until I've arrived. And God responds to us. We're merciful. He's merciful. We're pure. He's pure. If we are kind of underhanded, we'll get our reward. Things seem to work out that way. And so with people who are afflicted, who are caught, he's going to save them. He's willing to save them. But he's got his eye on the person who's haughty, who thinks more highly of himself than he ought to think. And suddenly this stuff comes up and it doesn't work out quite the way they think it should work. And sometimes we don't get the chance to uh, observe that and to find any kind of satisfaction. And uh, you want to be careful that you're not too overly satisfied when your enemy is afflicted. Don't take pleasure in that. Don't take great joy in that. Pray for them to be taken out of their affliction and to turn their heart to God. 
Don't take pleasure in it because it says that God may very well turn his attention to you. I'd like to conduct my life in a you know, quiet and, and a, a proper way so that maybe God won't have to take his attention onto me. <laughs> he responds to us. Psalm 73 kind of brings out the same thing. Uh, the uh, 28th verse says, but it is good for me to draw near to God. It's good for me to do this. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. This is a good thing to do. He is our refuge. He reacts. He rescues. He responds. He remakes. He remakes. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? For is my strength, uh, God is my strength and power, and he maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet. He setteth me upon the, my high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that the bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me so that my feet did not slip. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.17, he says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's a new, fresh start. I don't know if each of you remember it uh, and because it's only a few times in our life that we feel that release, that just... And I remember that was the way I felt when I turned my life over to the Lord. It was a great freedom that we had. And he becomes all these things to us, the buckler, the, the shield, the high tower, the rock. His way is perfect. He makes my feet like hinds feet on high places. There are 43 species in the genus uh, Cervidae. Uh, and at the time that that genus, by the way, that's deer, deer. At the time of his writing this, there were three deer that existed in the, that area of Israel. There's the uh, roe deer, which is a very small little critter, he's about yay high, has just a couple of small uh, antlers. The fallow deer, it's a little bit larger, and then there's the red deer, which is kind of like a small elk. It's a, it's a good-sized animal, and it looks very much like an elk, and it has a big rack, the, the male does. And the female is called a hind. And uh, so those of you who are into the hunting arts, you know, you can picture this. It says, he, he makes my feet like hind's feet. And, I, and you know what? I've, I've watched the deer. We've had a, a love-hate relationship with the deer uh, when we were in the flower business. And uh, all of you who raise flowers, you know how it is. You, know, you, just, you love seeing these deer because there is just nothing more graceful. They just have a graceful way in their movements and when they run and when they jump over something. They are delightful to watch. They're wonderful. But dread it. They like all the best flowers. <laughs> and so you ah, can't got to deal with that. You got to deal with that. And uh, I like to retell the story of my beloved who is a woman of great faith and is given to prayer. And that first year when we were out here on the farm and we had reactivated uh, my mother's flower beds when I was a little kid, you, you walked down to our house and on both sides were these massive flower beds. They were the most beautiful things. So you went through these beautiful flowers so that you could go knock on the door of the tar paper shack. Because that's what it was. It was a tar paper shack. But we had all these flowers around us. 
and it was gorgeous. Well, when we came back to the farm, that had, those flowers had been gone for 30 years, and there was nothing but weeds and grass and all that. And we went to work, and we'd ripped everything out of those beds, and, and then we got flowers. And Gwen transformed it into a, you know, a, a park. She just made it gorgeous. And at the top of the hill, I had this old wheelbarrow that had rusted away. I drug it up from underneath the building or somewhere out of the junk pile that my dad had accumulated. And here's this old rusty wheelbarrow and put it up at the top and I filled it full of dirt and we planted petunias in it. And the petunias grew up and they spilled over and they washed. And all the years that I lived on that farm, I grew up in that place. We had it for 56 years before we got rid of it. And uh, I grew up on it. And all the time that I was growing up, I never saw a deer anywhere in our neighborhood, ever. No deer anywhere in that spot. I tell people I'd never seen a deer and just down the road about a mile away from us and go down and down Hemholtz and out on the highway in the corner of Hemholtz, some of you will remember it used to be Operation Santa Claus and Mr. Uh, Zumstein had uh, these reindeer out there and there was just pens of them. There was reindeer everywhere and I say in all my years I'd never seen a deer on the property and going by the reindeer ranch, I've never seen a human. I'd go by there and there's nothing but deer. I never see anybody out there. Drive by, walk by, didn't matter. There's never anybody out there. Well, finally, the deer came in. And we came home and here the petunias were all nicely trimmed. <laughs> and Gwen was just <sighs> heartbroken. And of course, a, a traumatic thing like that drove her straight to her knees. And she's prayed, Lord, we know that you own the cattle on a thousand feet, <coughs> a thousand hills, and the beasts of the field are yours. Would you please tell your deer not to eat my flowers? You know, one time we drove in, I came in, and you come up the hill to park, and here is the apple tree, and it had a crab apple tree. <coughs> Excuse me. And under the crab apple tree are two or three deer, and they're bedded down. They're just sitting there. And there wasn't a flower anywhere that had been eaten. And they never ate our flowers. It just didn't happen. When we got out to Bend, she continued her life of prayer, and but I also uh, sprayed with some smelly stuff to try to keep them away. And there were times when I had to step out the back door and say, okay, fellas, <coughs> Off the flower bed, you can have the whole lawn. You can eat anything in the lawn, but get off the flower bed. So they get out of the flower beds and go down to the lawn and, you know, and go wandering off on their way. <clears throat> the hind's feet. Think of that beautiful animal. A deer, his feet are vertical. All the bones, the, he, has, he has finger bones just like you and I do. And those bones are vertical like this. And coming out of the end are the fingernails, and that's their hooves. It's keratin, just like your fingernails are keratin. And so it's a very thick keratin. And so they're the ballerinas of the world. They're walking around on their tippy toes like that. They kind of go down into it like that, and, and then you'll see their, their back dew claws that are back here. But generally, you see those front two fingers that are coming down. That's primarily how they are. And they're very, very graceful. And so the hunters, like I said, you guys hunters, you can envision this. You see, he makes the hind's feet on high places. You know, isn't that your dream to be kind of down there? And you see him up with the sky as a background so there's no distraction at all and you can take a perfect aim, you know, and <laughs> pick that thing off. Uh, that's kind of how this is is that he takes us, he makes my feet like hind's feet. And the thing about those hind's feet is that they are very, very accurate in how they get traction. You know, in these uh, animals with cloven hooves, you know, the, a lot of the little goats are the same way. They've got these little sharp little hooves and everything. And I've seen pictures, uh, there's this one uh, video I saw is a, a, this little goat thing, and there's a dam. They built this dam. It's in Europe, and so it's you're talking about a wall that's 
practically vertical. And here's this goat. He's way up in the middle of the dam there, and he's licking. He's getting the minerals out of the, out of the uh, mortar of the, the dam or out of the concrete or whatever it is. He's out there licking the, the thing to get it. And I've seen pictures of the, of the mountain sheep that have the same kind of feet and how they can leap from one rock to another rock and to a ledge and a, 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 a long ways, something that's impossible, and yet they do it. He makes us that way, hinds feet, puts us in high places, gives us a certain peace. I think the favorite one, uh, I, I was thinking when I was thinking about this last night, uh, I have a, a, a CD, and it's got a, uh, a song on it by a, a gospel quartet. I like southern gospel quartets. And these guys are singing a song. It says, I'm really not the man I ought to be, and I'm certainly not the man I want to be, but I thank God I'm not the man I used to be. And that's the whole point of it. And one of the most pleasant scriptures uh, to me is in Revelation 21, starting at verse, verses 5 and 6. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He remakes. Verses 38 through 46. He reinvigorates. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them and turned not again until I have consumed them. I have consumed them and wounded them and they could not rise. Yea, they have fallen under my feet. Thou hast girded me with strength to battle. Them that rose up against me hast thou subdued under me. Thou hast given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. They looked, but there was none to save, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not." Then did I beat them as small as the dust of the earth. I did stamp them as the mire of the street, and I did spread them abroad. Thou also hast delivered me from the strivings of my people. Thou hast kept me to be head of the heathen. A people which I knew not shall serve me. Strangers shall submit themselves unto me. As soon as they hear, they shall be obedient unto me. Strangers shall fade away, and they shall be afraid out of their close places." He reinvigorates, and David is thinking about all the battles that he had to fought, and as they went into that land, and as he took uh, leadership of the people of that land, it was still incumbent upon them to cast out the inhabitants who were under the judgment of God. Now I pray that war does not come to our shores. We have a place on the earth that really isolates us from a lot, but it's getting harder and harder because we keep devising things that will reach further and further in order to destroy our fellow man. And so it's not beyond the realm of possibility that we would find war coming to us here or that we would find war within the confines of our nation as we did 150-some years ago. So... I would pray that we would have peace and that we would not have that kind of war. But the reality is in life that as we walk through life, we have a constant war that's going on. We constantly have things that are assailing us. That sin nature that we have is always needing to be subdued. And we have these things that come in at us and we have to fight them. And as David says here, he fought him. He was reinvigorated. He had the strength, and it was by God's grace and, and his power that he was able to go in and to defeat enemy after enemy after enemy, and we should experience this in our lives also, that we go in and we defeat those enemies one after another after another after another and beat them as fine as dust and vanquish them. But when you get in that spot, don't become too complacent. 
Because he gets down to the end and he says, Thou hast kept me to be heed, head of the heathen. A people which I knew not shall serve me, and strangers shall submit themselves to me. So even though we beat things down, there's always going to be something new that can pop up. But the more we are invigorated by God and are victorious in the things in our life that spring up, a lot of times those things that spring up will flee and will not try to attack us the same way. They submit themselves unto me because it is God who reinvigorates us. And finally he rewards, the Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God, the rock of my salvation. It is God that avengeth me, and that bringeth down the people under me, that bringeth me forth from mine enemies. Thou also hast lifted me up on high above them that rose up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen. I will sing praises unto thy name. He is the tower of salvation for his king. He showeth mercy to his anointed, unto David, and to his seed forevermore. When we yield ourselves to him and we accept his authority in our life and we are willing to have him exhibit his power through our life, there are rewards for that. And when the rewards come and there is the peaceful time, that's not the time to be complacent, as I said, but it is a time to reflect. And then it's the time to say, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. Always acknowledge that. In 2 Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy. The fourth chapter in the sixth verse. And you know, Paul is getting to the end of his life. And he's a tired old man who has had a very successful ministry. And has seen God working through him. And he says, for I am now ready to be offered... And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. But here's the good news. It's not for those particular elite people who God has really chosen to use in a particularly powerful way but also for us vanilla Christians who are out of the way and insignificant in our estimation. And so Paul says, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. That promises to you and I. Praise God. Lord, thank you. You have blessed us above all peoples of the earth. You have blessed us individually in ways that just leave us dumbfounded. Lord, you are plenteous in mercy. You are overflowing in grace. And you are abounding in love. And I pray, Lord, that that would flow through each one of us. Help us to love each other. Help us to love our neighbors around us. Help us to serve you as we ought. And help us to give you glory forever and ever. Amen.